As we gather for worship this morning, let's, let's take up our hymnals, let's open our mouths, sing praise to our God from the heart. Hymn number one, hymn number one, all people that on earth do dwell. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at Covenanters as we come into the presence of this God who we have already begun to praise and sing our praise to, but in a few moments, He will call us into His presence and call us to come into uh, and, and worship Him and to receive His blessing as we do so. Special welcome to our visitors this morning. It's a joy to have you here with us, and we pray you will also be blessed in the worship of uh, the one true living God this morning. Uh, after our morning service, we'll have our time of refreshments and fellowship. We look forward to getting to know uh, you as well during that time. Uh, this, today, we won't have our formal uh, sermon discussion time, um, but we will, also, we will be preparing for our outdoor service uh, as, uh, as we look forward to that this afternoon uh, during our normal afternoon service time, um, which service time is at 4.30, but please plan to, if you're able, uh, to arrive a bit early. Um, and uh, to help with setup, it looks, uh, looks like uh, the Lord's been answering our prayers in terms of the weather, um, and it uh, looks, like uh, looks like a beautiful afternoon that we'll have, but if, if the Lord's plans are, are, uh, are different and thus better than ours, then we'll meet inside, and, uh, and Lord willing, that won't hinder anyone who wants to come. Um, but do, do come a bit early, and at 3.50, uh, we'll gather here as, uh, as a church family in the sanctuary, and we'll have a few moments of prayer, of corporate prayer together, um, and so uh, we can pray for those who are coming and uh, pray for the Lord's blessing on the worship and the preaching. Uh, Jordan will be preaching this afternoon uh, on uh, the, the, begin, the first sermon on the theme of uh, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he'll be focusing on Jesus Christ as the same yesterday and today. And Lord willing, in a couple of weeks, I'll preach on 
the last part of that. Jesus Christ is the same today and forever. Um, one just note as well, because uh, the afternoon service liturgy is different than normal, uh, if you, uh, with both the offering envelopes, the morning and the afternoon offering envelopes can be put in this morning's offering um, when that's taken up. Uh, and then one other note, uh, one thing uh, to, to mention and to give thanks to the Lord for, um, we are uh, certainly thankful to the Lord for the last five weeks with Jordan and Leanna, and um, I guess we're, we're, uh, we're thankful to have Salem and Haven and Isla here, and we're glad they brought their parents along with them. But uh, it's been, uh, it has been a joy to have them here. We're very thankful to the Lord for Jordan's ministry uh, here with us, uh, and uh, both the public ministry, um, and just also their hospitality and having uh, various families over, and, and just that, that fellowship, and I've appreciated having uh, Jordan here as well in, our, uh, in, in some of the, the different ministries we were involved in. So this is their last Sunday with us. They head back to Ontario this week, uh, early this week. So please take the time to, uh, to thank them for their service and uh, to wish them the Lord's blessing. And uh, as Jordan goes back to, to uh, begin, takes up the seminary studies in a couple weeks. Really, it's always ongoing, it seems, but, uh, but really intensively in a couple weeks. So uh, pray, let's, let's give thanks to the Van Amarongans and give thanks to the Lord for what has been a, a very helpful, blessed internship time. Well, let's take a, uh, a few moments uh, now to prepare our hearts for uh, worship. Let's ask the Lord in silent prayer for His blessing upon us and to focus us upon Him. Brothers and sisters in Christ, please stand and hear your God call you to worship this morning. And we hear His call to worship from the words, that he, the, the gracious words He spoke to His, uh, his to the twelve uh, disciples, apostles that uh, that He had called as He calls them to come to Him for rest. And so, from Mark chapter six, the apostles gathered to Jesus, told Him all things, both what they had done and what they had taught, and He said to them. Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going. They did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. What this teaches us as, as God's people is that He cares for us. That's why He gave us the Sabbath. He loves uh, us, and that's why he, he knows our weakness, and He is gracious to call us to come aside, even in this hour of worship, to come aside, to rest a while, to rest in Him. And so... Let's seek His grace and to be able to do that this morning and to know His refreshing presence with us. Lord, our God, You are the God who has told us, who has offered to us, Lord, that with those wonderful sweet words, come to me, you that are burdened, heavy laden, weary, and I will give you rest. Lord, we come for rest. We come aside from our regular activities, from our usual work, from our daily uh, strains and stresses to come, Lord, for rest. We come not because we're strong or have it all figured out, but because we're tired and weak and needy. Some of us, Lord, are too self-satisfied, and we come with hardly a thought about our need, and perhaps we just come because this is what we do, and yet, Lord, we pray that You would correct that attitude. We have nothing and are nothing without You. We need You. Lord, we come as sinners needing forgiveness and needing to grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We come as a people needing to offer worship to their God, and in the best way you have given in public worship through Christ, empowered by the Holy Spirit. God, we pray then that we would, this would be a restful, refreshing, strengthening time. We do pray, Lord, today that you would feed us, that you would fill us with yourself, but yet also, Lord, leave us hungry for more, desiring more, that, Lord, this would not be enough, but we'd want you more and more and more. 
Lord, call us and lead us as Your disciples, that we would hear You speak to us through the Word, that we would believe, that we would practice the truth. Lord, this is only the first opportunity we have this day to come to receive Your rest and to worship You. We have a second one yet, Lord, on the Sabbath, and this afternoon, gather us together again, and we pray with many of our friends and our neighbors, those whom we have invited to come and worship You, that together we would hear a message of stability, strength, hope in Jesus Christ. We pray that for this morning. We pray that again for this afternoon. And we pray that Your blessing would rest upon us this day according to Your grace given to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's sing hymn 508. Hymn 508. Jesus, lover of my soul.
seated. Revelation of the will of God for us as His people comes to us from Galatians 5. Read verses 16 to 26. This is a message for God's people who have been washed and redeemed in Jesus Christ, or how we're to live, how our lives ought to look, and in whom we have the victory when we have the flesh battling against the Spirit. Uh, And so this is a message for you in Christ, and our confidence is in Christ. If you're not in Christ this morning, you need to flee to Christ, for these commands cannot be obeyed by you outside of Jesus Christ. And so this is a call not to try harder and do better, but to plead for mercy and forgiveness and the grace of God in Christ. As believers, this is a good reminder to us and also seeking the power of the Spirit to shape us to be like Jesus, who perfectly displayed the fruit of the Spirit always at all times. So let's hear the words of God from Galatians 5 verse 16. I say then, walk in the Spirit. You shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Let's come before God to confess our sin and to seek His grace. He set us apart for Himself. Let's plead with Him that we would live a life that is worthy of those who have been set apart by God. Lord our God, we thank You that we can come to You in prayer. We have a place to go with our repentance. We have a place to come to confess our sin, a place we don't need to hide or pretend or make it seem like things are better than they are. But Lord, we can come. We can come to You through Christ and plead for forgiveness, and things will be made better than they are. We will be advanced in godliness because that is your work that you do through your Spirit. Lord, we thank you here in this passage. We're not left in despair to simply contemplate our sins and all of us to see and think and consider that in our hearts, uh, some or many of these things uh, continue to exist. There's this battle that goes on, but Lord, that we can we can come to Christ. We're brought back to the gospel message, brought back to the, your power to transform us and to change us, that you are at work in us to provide all the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Lord, we have been set apart by you. That is what you have done. You've sancti- you, you have sanctified and are sanctifying us. That is, you've, you have set us apart and you're making us more and more holy. But Lord, we are reserved for you, body and soul. We are to be given to you completely. And Lord, we pray that we would live that way, that we would not, uh, we would not seek or d- desire or allow ourselves to be used for any other purpose, to, say, to serve any evil or to, or, in, in, or to serve the evil one himself. Lord, you have set us apart and you continue to make us more and more holy and pure. Or this is what you've begun in us from the moment when we have believed. And you are not satisfied with merely forgiving our sins. You want to produce holiness in us. You want us to be displays of your grace, to have your grace displayed in our lives. Lord, we all have various gifts and talents. But Lord, what we really need is to produce good fruit in our lives. What we really need is for you to produce that good fruit in us. 
Gifts and talents are good, but only so far as you make them holy in us and that they are used in a holy way by us. What good is talking well when we lack love? Or being book smart when we lack humility? Being a good listener when we gossip? Or, Lord, of, of uh, being one who, who people look up to, but yet we're impatient and unkind, and, Lord, we're, we're harsh. Uh, God, there are, uh, there, there are various gifts and talents that we have we use. We pray we'd use them in a godly and a faithful way, and forgive us when we do not. Forgive us when we do not produce fruit to match our profession. And do not live a gracious life that matches Christ. Lord, we are Yours. May we serve no other master, love no other Lord, and bow to no other God. You have set us apart in Jesus Christ. May we rejoice in that truth. May we give thanks for Your love and show by our lives that You are the chief desire of our lives. So it was for Jesus Christ always. So may it be for His disciples, for us that we would live like He did, even as His righteousness is applied to us by the Spirit. Oh God, we thank You for forgiveness in Christ, and we look to You for holiness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Encouragement as we talk about the battle between the flesh and the Spirit, that in the Spirit of God we are made free to live holy. Romans 8 verses 1 to 4, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. In Christ is life. Outside of Christ is death. Give thanks to God for your salvation, that God did it. Blessed be our God. At this time, in thanksgiving to our God and remembering that all all that we have comes from Him, let's give our tithes and our offerings for His service. The hymn that we'll sing now as we prepare for the reading and preaching of God's Word is hymn 627, Behold the Throne of Grace. 627, we'll stand to sing to our God.
seated. Open your Bibles and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 9. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, where we'll read the first eight verses, and then we'll turn to the Gospel of Luke and pick up our study there. So think of the words, of, hear the words of the Queen of Sheba, uh, which he says about the glories of Solomon, including to Solomon's servants, then think about that in terms of the greater Solomon, in terms of Christ who has come, and how much greater it is for us to be able to serve Him and dwell in His presence. Second Chronicles 9, Now when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon, she came to Jerusalem to test Solomon with hard questions having a very great retinue, camels that bore spices, gold in abundance, and precious stones. And when she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was in her heart. So Solomon answered all her questions. There was nothing so difficult for Solomon that he could not explain it to her. And the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and their apparel, and his entryway by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. Then she said to the king, It was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe their words until I came and saw with my own eyes, and indeed the half of the greatness of your wisdom was not told me. You exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men. And happy are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on his throne to be the king, to be king for the Lord your God, because your God has loved Israel to establish them forever. Therefore, he made you a king. He made you king over them to do justice and righteousness. We can turn now to Luke chapter 6. I'll read the first 19 verses. Just considering as I'm reading 2 Chronicles 9, if I think that describes something of heaven. When we get to heaven, the half of what we'll understand has not been told to us of the glories of our Lord, the greatness of our God, and of the worship we will enjoy to all eternity. I thank God He already gives us a true revelation and a true experience of something of that already in this life. Luke chapter 6, we'll read the first 19 verses. Now it happened on the second Sabbath after the first that he went through the grain fields, and his disciples plucked the heads of grain and ate them, rubbing them in their hands. And some of the Pharisees said to them, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath? Jesus, answering them, said, have you, have you not even read this, what David did when he was hungry, and he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of God, took and ate the showbread, and also gave some to those with him, which is not lawful for any but the priests to eat? And he said to them, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Now it happened on another Sabbath also that he entered the synagogue and taught, and a man was there whose right hand was withered. So the scribes and Pharisees watched him closely, whether he would heal on the Sabbath, that they might find an accusation against him. But he knew their thoughts and said to the man who had the withered hand, Arise and stand here. And he arose and stood. Then Jesus said to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy? And when he had looked around at them all, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he did so. And his hand was restored as whole as the other. But they were filled with rage and disgust with one another what they might do to Jesus. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer to God. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And from them he chose twelve whom he also named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter. And Andrew, his brother. James and John, Philip and Bartholomew. Matthew and Thomas. James, the son of Alphaeus 
and Simon called the zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who also became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the seacoast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits. And they were healed, and the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Let's ask the Lord to bless the reading and equip the preaching of the Word. Thank you, Lord, that you have revealed yourself to us. In the Scriptures, we have the clear revelation, all that we need to know for faith and practice, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, to be saved, and to live our lives faithfully before you, our triune God. So, Lord, we ask that as we consider a part of Your Word this morning, we've read more and we'll consider in the preaching a smaller section, yet we pray in all of it that Your blessing would rest upon it, and that Your Word, that the the seed that is sown even this day, would land upon hearts prepared by You and would in due time bear fruit, that You would be further honored and glorified by the lives of those who live for You in accordance to Your truth. God, we pray that we all then would hear and listen. And give me the grace and strength and the power of the Spirit above all else to preach a faithful word and represent you well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you, uh, if you have a, a business or if someone's involved in, a, in, a, in leading or owns a sports team or is part of a sports team, One of the things you want, not just for now, you think about the future, thinking about down the road, thinking about what kind of legacy you want to leave, is you want to to leave a, a, a company or a sports team or some other organization you're part of. You want to leave it in in a place where it can prosper and continue to prosper going down the road, continue to expand and grow or be successful, win championships or or do well what it's meant to do. In order to To do that, you need to realize you're not going to be there. And so you need to be thinking about who's going to replace you, who's going to be the leaders of the future in that business. There needs to be some sort of leadership selection process that successfully identifies uh, those who will take over. And we see this in, in corporations. They get the best headhunters to go and to find those people who have the gifts, the talents, the experience that they need to keep the business going or take it to the next level. They've got, they've got their, their, their people and looking at the, the, the best universities to find the brightest young minds to shape and transform and to, to build on for the future. Sports teams have their scouts that go all over the world looking for Though that hidden gem of a baseball player or a hockey player trying to find somebody who they'll be able to get and no one else can get and they can develop. Or the front office is busy trying to, trying to make a trade deal to bring in the star player so that they can advance to the playoffs and win championships. And all of these things are looking at the gifts that someone has, their natural talents, their their. Uh, abilities that, that, that are demonstrated, and they're looking to, for someone who already has that, or can, they can work and build on what that person is. Well, how, how should it be in the church? Is it different? Should the church look for, the future, for future leaders differently than in the business world, in the corporate world, or in sports? Well, as we even come to answer that question, the first thing, of course, we need to remember is that the church is Christ's church. It is His church, and therefore it's His prerogative to decide what is the best way for the future, the best way to develop leadership in the church, what is the best for the future of the church. And if you look at the words of God that are given to us uh, in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 about leaders and what leaders are to be. We find, of course, there that, that it's character that matters far more than natural gifts or than, than talents. It's the supernatural that trumps the natural in terms of who God wants to be 
in leadership, God's supernatural grace on their lives rather than just simply some natural abilities that they have. And that emphasis that that is explicitly given in, uh, in, in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and in other places as well is implied here in the passage. We see, we see this is the emphasis of Christ the King. It's, his em- it's the emphasis that ought to be on the church for the normal, ordinary offices of the church, minister, elders, and deacons. But it's also the emphasis, it flows out of the very emphasis Christ had when He chose the extraordinary officers, officers of the church, in this case, the apostles, the twelve apostles. And so as we consider this passage this morning, verses 12 to 16 of Luke 6, it's, we need to give thanks to our Lord for His way of choosing leaders. And we need to then say, what does it teach us about how God develops His people for service in the church and prepares His church and provides for His church for the future? A lesson for us as a congregation as we look uh, Lord, Lord willing, into the future in choosing men to serve in office. But it's also, there are lessons here for all of us, for all of our lives. There's a call to all of us to be actively pursuing the transforming grace of God that reshapes us, makes us all more like Jesus Christ, and makes us then more faithful and able to be more fruitful for the kingdom of God. Some of you are fearful about the idea of serving the church. I'm not just talking about the offices of the church, though that is there, but serving in some kind, there's a, there's a sense of, I don't have anything to offer. Who am I to be able to serve? What can, I can't speak well. I, I, I can't, and you list all the things you can't do. The call of this passage is not saying, you're right, you, you have nothing to offer. Thanks for trying out anyway. No, it's to say, come to Jesus Christ. The only way anyone is faithful and then fruitful for the church is because they're following Jesus and trusting Him as they step out to serve. He's the one who makes anyone, anyone good for the church. Others of you are lazy, and you would rather let others do the work of the church, and you'll just assume it's going to carry on. I show up, but others will take care of it, and I'll just follow along because I'm busy building my own kingdom. I'm busy building my own life. I'm busy seeking my kingdom first and its pleasures rather than seeking first the kingdom of God and and His righteousness and trusting that everything else that I ever need in life will be added. And that's a place for you to repent and to say, Lord, I'm using what you've given me in a wrong manner. I need to serve you. I need to walk with you. I need to follow you, forsaking all else, and follow you in every calling you give me in my life. The only prerequisite to service to Christ in the church is faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ, believing on Him and living in Him as your Lord and Savior. And then, as you walk with Jesus, as you learn from Jesus, as you grow in, your, in that Christian life, you will become, by His Word and Spirit, more faithful and thus more useful to the kingdom. And whatever natural gifts and talents God has given you will be sanctified, made holy, and used in a holy way. What you need and what we learn what the church needs here is the church needs Jesus. You might look at a passage like this and think, well, who's it going to be about? Is it going to be about Peter? Maybe it's going to be about James and John. There's a lot of names here. Maybe it's just going to be about all these guys. No, you know, the focus of the passage is Jesus. It's the king and head of the church. That's what our focus will be this morning, to build his church. The sent out Jesus first seeks his father and then selects the the 12 whom he will shape and send out. To build his church, the sent out Jesus first seeks his father and then selects the twelve he will shape, he will shape and send out. That's really how it, it, the text flows out. From verse 12, it's the sent out Jesus seeks the father. And then verses 13 to 16, the sent out Jesus selects those twelve that he will subsequently shape and send out. 
Well, when you're involved in some cause, particularly in a righteous cause, what is your response when you face opposition? When people speak out against it, people oppose it, people act in a way that, that's, that seems to want uh, you to try to get you to stop doing what you're doing. Well, what's Jesus Christ's response? Because this is actually what's been happening to him. He's been being, he's being opposed. The Pharisees following him around, looking at him, watching him, finding fault with everything he does, just like that's the way they live their life. They love finding fault with all kinds of people. Well, are you surprised to hear that Jesus' response is to pray and to press on? To pray and then to press on in his kingdom-building work, in the work the Father had sent him to do. Now, some of you, as you're about to, as you're working on a project, or about to take on a project, some of you plan, 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 plan. You love to plan it out. Some of you just want to get to doing it. I want to get it done. Let's get to work. Let's do this. This is, there, there are strengths and weaknesses in both of those approaches. But what is Jesus' approach? Jesus' approach is first to pray. It's to stop and to pray And that is to be our approach as we seek to honor God in everything we do in our life. Now, that might cause you, maybe not outwardly, but inwardly anyway, to roll your eyes and say, oh, of course we got to pray about it. But you know, I'll say one one thing I'll say about that is the unspoken is often the undone. And if it's the assumption, of course we'll do that, it's not likely you're going to do it or do it with a very good spirit. The point of praying over what we do and what God calls us to do in the church or in our careers or with our families is not merely to baptize whatever, thing, whatever we feel like doing with prayer and just saying, well, I prayed about it, so at least I did, okay, let's check that and then we'll move on and now we'll get to the real business of planning and doing. That's trite praying, that's faithless praying, that's simply trying to do something and hoping you get something. But such true prayer is prayer that's offered because you know your need, because you know that whatever I'm going to set my hands to do, whatever talents and gifts and abilities I have, whatever other people are coming to help me to do this particular thing, I need the Lord in this so that I'm doing it with a good heart, in a faithful manner, striving to serve Him, that when things go wrong, I act in a godly and Christian manner. Don't lose my temper and throw the hammer. I don't act, and, and I, that, that my heart is set before the Lord, saying, Lord, you've called me to do this in service of my family. I want to do this well. Enable me to do it faithfully. We need to know our need. True prayer flows out of knowing our need. Whatever else you have that you still need the Lord. That's really why Jesus was praying. He knew what He needed. He needed His Father, and He needed the strength of the Spirit In His humanity, He wrestled all night in prayer with the Father, not because He was watching His watch and saying, oh good, okay, I've I've done done 11 hours. If I get to 12, then it's like you just hit a new level, and I just, I level up, and I'm going to get more things. No, He desired it. He knew His need. He knew His need. He had joy in His Father being in His presence, knowing His Father delighted to spend time with Him, and He desired the strength of the Spirit because he had to choose the 12 apostles, and he was, going to, uh, he was going to preach the Sermon on the Plain that's coming up right after. He prayed out of need and desire. Prayer, brothers and sisters, is the gift that God has given us through Jesus Christ, because it's through Jesus Christ that we too, the God, it's through Jesus Christ that we have the way open for us to go to the Father. He delights to spend time with us. We are accepted by God. We are given the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who enables our prayers. We don't even know what to pray for as we ought. Do you love that time with your Father? Do you get to spend that time? That when you're about to take on something, or you're about to, to you're looking for ways to serve, or someone asks you to serve in a particular way, you're saying, I need to spend time with my Father because I can't do anything without Him. You might say, well, we prayed all night. I've never prayed like that. I will say, this is not meant to tell you that your only, only good prayers are prayers that are prayed all night. It's the only time in, in the New Testament that we find someone praying all night long. It was an intense task that was laying out before Jesus, and he needed that time with the Father. But the point here is, you say, I never, I'll never be able to pray like that. It's not to compare your watch with Jesus, your stopwatch with His stopwatch, but it's to compare your need. 
If the master needed to spend the time with his father, do you not need to spend time with your father in heaven? Do you need him less? If the perfect sinless Jesus still delighted in that time with, with his father, do we who are sinners and much weaker than him because of it, do we not need him? And I'll point you that quote in the bulletin that I point to ponder and mention it here is that statement for us to consider. If you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. If you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. You can actually take that back to even the previous section about the Sabbath. If you're too busy to keep the Sabbath, you're too busy. We need to prioritize our lives like Jesus prioritized His and God wants us to. A prayer is hard work. Prayer is hard work. There's no, it's not, no, one go, no one goes to prayer, ah, that was easy. Oh, man, I don't pray like that because there for them it's just so simple, so easy. Prayer is hard work. We wrestle with our own physical and spiritual drawbacks. We, we are, we are, it's hard to do, but it's good work. It's needed work. Ask the Holy Spirit for help to pray. Ask Him to take away those barriers to pray. And perhaps we need to remember James 4 verse 2 is both a warning and an exhortation. You have not because you ask not. You have not because you ask not. And here, as we consider what Jesus was praying about and, how, and, and, and his, his prayer life, it reminds you and me that the primary work of the people of God the people of God who desire the church to be strong into the future, who desire the church to be stronger in the present, who desire faithful leaders to lead them under Christ, is to pray. There's more to do than pray in terms of developing leaders and training and teaching. And certainly there's more to do, but it begins here because it puts the emphasis back on God, not on the person, not on you, but on God. He's the one who provides, and so He's the one we seek. The greatest difference you can make for your church and the leaders in your church is to pray for them. The greatest difference you can make for me as your pastor and for the preaching of the Word, and, and, and if you are considering thinking, I want to be fed by the Word, and I'm struggling to be fed by the Word, the greatest difference you can make is to pray. And the greatest difference you can make in your own heart's desire to serve Christ to put Him first, is to pray. That's in your private prayers. That's for you heads of your homes as you lead your families in prayer. That's for us as a church as we gather, as we pray in worship, as we pray at our prayer meetings. Come. Come this afternoon. Come at 3.50. Make it a point to be here to pray for even just a few moments, whether you pray out loud or silently, but to be here to pray for the work we do as the church in, in witnessing and sharing the gospel with each other and with our neighbors. That's what Jesus does. He makes prayer His priority. To build His church, the sent out Jesus first seeks His Father. And then He selects the twelve that He will shape and send out. After prayer, He takes next steps to build His church. Now, I'll say this. As we go through these people, I think one of the things you're going to have in the back of your mind is, well, what about Judas Iscariot? What about Judas? I'm going to speak of the twelve, but we'll come to Judas specifically uh, as we, at, at the end, as the text does. We'll come to Judas. We'll consider what about Judas. But hear what Christ is doing as He m calls these twelve apostles out of His disciples. You can imagine Jesus praying through the night. He was praying for these men specifically by name specifically knowing them, knowing their need, praying to the Father for them. That's a great comfort because He prays for you and me specifically by name. He prays for you and me according to our particular need. He doesn't just lump us all together. The Lord our God as our mediator in heaven continues to pray for us specifically. That's a great comfort for you in Jesus Christ. And it's a great loss if you're not trusting in Jesus Christ this morning. You need, to be, you need to be trusting in Christ, to know the benefits and the blessings of Christ, not just, not just heaven, but to know the ongoing work of Christ on your behalf. Well, he, he, after he prayed, he went to the mountain to pray, continued all night, and when it was day, he called 
his disciples to himself. And out of, those, out of the disciples, the larger group of disciples, he chose 12, whom he also named apostles. Now, we use the word disciple and apostle, and, and it's good, I think, for us to, though we, those terms may be familiar to us to some degree, it's good to define these terms, understand the difference in, in, in the contrast here that's meant in the text. A disciple is literally a learner, someone who's learning from whoever they're learning from. It was, it was one who, who would follow a particular teacher and learn from them. In New Testament times, these times, it would literally, you'd find that teacher and you would attach yourself to him and you would follow him around, literally follow him around. You might listen to what he was teaching, learn from him, and not just know more stuff, but put it into practice, actually live it out in your life demonstrate. Someone says, you're Jesus' disciple because you are acting like Him. You are teaching like He does. Now, you and I who are in Christ are disciples of Jesus, though He has ascended into heaven and we don't literally walk around behind Jesus. Yet when we hear His Word proclaimed, when we believe the Word that He has given to us, that is in the Scriptures, when, when we walk with Jesus by the means that He has given, being under the Word, learning from the Word, learn from Jesus daily, we are His disciples. We are following Him, seeking to learn from Him so that we might serve Him. Now, we often think of the disciples as the twelve, but the New Testament also speaks of Jesus having disciples that were beyond the twelve. There were various. At one point, He chose, he chose 70 and sent them out, but there was a group there were, there were those in the crowds who followed Jesus wherever He went, and it's out of this larger group that Jesus chose 12 specifically who we call the disciples and who we call the apostles. So He chose these 12 from them, and he, whom, he also, whom He also named apostles. Well, what's an apostle? An apostle is one, literally, who is sent out. He's one who is sent out by whoever sends him out to represent him, to be an official representative, to go and speak the word of that person. So like an ambassador, which is what Paul uh, calls ministers of the gospel, ambassadors for Jesus Christ, going not to proclaim their own message, but sent out to proclaim the message of the gospel, to proclaim the message of Christ, to go and to declare to Israel and to Samaria and to all the far reaches of the earth that Jesus Christ has come. You are a sinner in need of a Savior, and Jesus Christ is the only Savior. And you can, if you, he, His offer of the gospel, His offer of salvation is freely given. Now, these apostles, we don't see the word apostle much in the gospels, but we find it more in Luke. And Luke is attaching uh, that word apostle. He's kind of drawing this connection between the gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, which he would write, where the apostolic work really begins after Pentecost, where they, they begin to go out and to preach in the power of the Spirit. The word apostle can really, it also has, could be so broad that it applies to us, we being sent out by our Lord to be representatives of Him as Christians in the world. That's not, that's not how it's used in the, in the New Testament, though in the New Testament it does, some, it does include men like Barnabas and Timothy, they're sometimes called apostles. They too were sent out but mostly in the New Testament, refers to this particular office that Christ temporarily set up, the 12 apostles whom He called. Why 12? Because they were, they were a picture of the new Israel. They just, as Israel had the 12 tribes, the 12 patriarchs, so the church has the 12 apostles who are spreading the church far beyond the borders of Israel, who are spreading the church now beyond to the ends of the earth. Israel, the church, was expanding and growing. And these, and, 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 and the 12 apostles whom Jesus was calling were intended to be the foundation of that church. It was a temporary office. It was to lay the foundation of the church with Christ as the cornerstone. Consider the picture of the church in Revelation 21. Now, the wall of the city, had, this is speaking of the New Jerusalem, the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So this is a particular temporary office. We do not have apostles in the church today. But before we consider the actual the, 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 the twelve who are listed here, it's good to take, maybe take a, take a step back and to consider that the very first apostle, 
the very first and the greatest who was sent out was Jesus Christ Himself. He was sent by His Father into this world with a message and a mission to establish His kingdom, to preach the gospel, to call all men, women, and children to repent and believe because the kingdom of God is at hand. He's the original one who has been sent out, and it's His message that he, he goes and He proclaims that message of salvation from God, and it's that message that Christ proclaims that now these 12 are being set apart to continue, that they too will proclaim and declare this message and, and spread the church far beyond, as particularly after Christ has ascended up into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God and where He continues to reign and rule over His church. So we see, again, this is not about the disciples, is it? This passage is not about the disciples. It's about Jesus. It's about the one who has been sent and the one who is sending out. So we see from disciples to apostles by the great apostle. But then we see as we consider the particular names that are given to us, we see how the Christ is working and calling these men and will shape them, moving them from their natural weakness to their supernatural strength to do the work He calls them to do. Notice in verse 13, the emphasis. When it was day, He called His disciples to Himself, and from them He chose. He chose. This was, there were no job applications. There were no apostle applications. Get them in by Friday, and we'll, we'll, we'll call you if we're interested. Jesus Christ chose to fill these places by His own wisdom, according to His own standard. It was not, perhaps, the dream team that you and I might have chosen, but it was the chosen team that He had by His own prerogative. And these were men who were not going to become apostles or even faithful disciples overnight. There was a, going to be a gradual process of making them, uh, teaching them, bringing them to understand who Christ was and what He was there to do, of sanctifying them and preparing them for their service to the church all the way through Pentecost and beyond, but Pentecost is a particularly defining moment, the whole pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon them. Now, this is good for you and I to remember because as you desire to serve Christ in your Christian life, and you ought to desire, and you ought to pursue that, and you ought to pursue and say, Lord, make me more faithful, be patient. Be patient with yourself. That's not a call to don't worry about it, be lazy. It's a call to be patient. And trust the Lord to work in you. Trust the Lord to, to, to develop and grow you. And it's going to come through various experiences in your life, through trials and, and tests where God is going to draw you closer to Himself. It's going to come as you pick up the Scriptures and are in the Scriptures, as you read other, other material that is helpful, as you uh, engage in the life of the church in regular, ongoing, week-by-week -week service, patiently, patiently, step-by-step. Not trying to rush ahead, but simply being content with God's gradual work in your life. And that also is a call to patience with each other. New believers are not sanctified. They're not born again Monday and sanctified completely a Tuesday. We need to be patient with each other, love each other, care for each other, and pray for each other. And trust, Jesus Christ makes perfect. He didn't call you because you are perfect but He calls you and promises to make you perfect. How have you stumbled this week? You stumbled this week in a way that's really discouraged you. How can I, how can I serve Jesus when I act like that, when I've done this? Or, oh, I thought that sin was behind me. I didn't, suddenly it, it flares, it comes again. I thought, I thought I was, run to Jesus, to your brother, to your sister. Don't run from Him but run to Him and say, Lord, sanctify me even more. Make me holier yet. Make me more faithful and forgive me for where I am yet sinning. That's what these 12 also needed to learn. Jesus chose Peter. Jesus chose Peter. Peter, who was bold and brash, and often needed sharp correction because he had a sharp personality. Peter, who 
was blown about by the wind. He was unsteady in his commitment, desired to be lost in himself. And yet it's interesting because Jesus names him Peter. He was Simon, but Jesus names him Peter, which means rock. He didn't choose Peter because he was steady. He chose him because he would make him steady. He would make him steadfast in his faithfulness to the Lord. Peter, the leader, the natural leader, and yet who needed supernatural grace to lead well amongst the twelve. And then there's Andrew. Andrew, who lived in the shadow of his, his brother Peter. He was overshadowed by Peter. Andrew, we don't know, we don't hear much about, but you know, it's Andrew who introduced Peter to Jesus. And it's fine, it's, inter- it's interesting because wherever we find Andrew in the New Testament, he's introducing somebody to Jesus. Andrew quietly goes about his service. You know, it's interesting, there are times in church history, some of the great men in church history who have been saved by an unknown preacher. People, they might even forget who it was. John Owen, the great 17th century exegete of Scripture and, and, and British Puritan, he, he went, he was, he, I don't know if he was a believer at the time or not, but he certainly had no peace with God. He was wrestling and he was struggling, and he went to a church, there's going to be a famous preacher, and then they get up and announce, sorry, that guy's sick, and there's this, little, like, there's this country bumpkin of a preacher who's coming to preach in this place. I don't, probably didn't introduce him that way, but essentially, that's what it was. It was some country preacher, and the friend said, his friend that had come with Owen said, come on, let's go, we'll go, there's another guy, he's just up the road, we'll go we'll listen to him. And Owen's like, I'm too tired, I, I just, I can't. So he sat there. And it was that message from that preacher the Lord used to bring peace flooding into Owen's heart and life and transforming him and, you, and, and one step in preparation for his service to the church, and he can't remember his name, we don't know who he is, and the Lord used him. You don't need to be a Peter to have an effect in the church of Jesus Christ. You don't need to be the big, brash leader. You can be an Andrew who simply introduces people to Jesus. Then there were James and John, who Jesus and uh, who Mark records. Jesus, uh, sorry, Mark records them as being called the sons of thunder. Oh, the Samaritan village doesn't want to listen to you, Jesus. Just bring some fire down upon them. That'll teach them. Hey, wait, you've got the kingdom coming. Can we have the best seats in the kingdom? We would really like to be on the right and the left. These were men who needed to be reshaped in humility and in love, and they were. John is the disciple of love. That wasn't the impression you get off the first pages, the introduction of John through the Gospels. There's others here that are in this list who, of whom we know very little about. In fact, sometimes they're just a couple specific stories, and from that we've, we've framed our minds about them. There's Thomas the doubter. There's Nathaniel, it's Bartholomew, uh, named Bartholomew here, who's Nathaniel, who was doubting that anything good can come out of Galilee and didn't believe the report of Philip about Jesus. There's there's Matthew, who is Levi, who we met a little while ago, the tax collector. And then there's Simon the zealot, who uh, would, he and Levi, and he and Matthew in another life would not have gotten along very well because he was just anti-Rome all the way and ready to take up arms and let's get rid of these Romans and let's restore the kingdom. And there's, there's Judas. All we know about Judas is he's not that Judas. But yet the Lord brings them together. And we ought to be careful, even as we think about doubting Thomas, we have these names. Don't define them by what we read about in those early days, those early years. But remember, Christ is refining them. And so we can define them differently, not as being who they once were, but who they are in Christ. That's our defining. That's how we're defined, who we are in Christ, what Jesus does what Jesus has done in them. And we can also recognize as we look at this list of people, Jesus Christ builds His church with all kinds of people. What a mix of people there are there, there is here. But it's unity. It's unity in Jesus Christ that makes all the difference. Jesus makes all the difference. And what a joy. These men would spend with Jesus for three years learning, following, being reshaped, reformed, prepared for greater service. You know, the queen of uh, Sheba comes to Solomon and she, she, she declares, blessed are your servants who get to dwell in your court, who get to drink in your wisdom, learn from you. And how wonderful and amazing it would be. And yet, we serve a greater Solomon. We serve one. What a blessing it is for us 
to be able to dwell in the presence of God, to learn from our Lord as He disciples and shapes us. What was the defining thing about the disciples? You remember that that famous interaction in Acts chapter 4 that Luke records for us, where they're before the religious leaders, and they're being They're being accused of all sorts of things, of promoting the name of Jesus. And then Peter and John are speaking boldly. And we read in Acts 4.13, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. That's what shaped them. That's what transformed them. There were all kinds, and we are all kinds of people. And there are all kinds of people out there who we desire to hear the gospel and believe. There are all kinds of people, but all kinds that are in Jesus Christ. When we think about leadership in the church, brothers and sisters, the church doesn't need the gifted as the first priority. We don't need the businessman. We don't need the charismatic man. Those things don't disqualify from leadership, but they don't pre-qualify for leadership. What the church needs is men who live their lives with Jesus. To serve as our pastors, our elders, and our deacons. What the church needs is men and women who day in and day out live their lives for Jesus Christ. That's who we need sitting in the pew. That's what we need in our hearts. That's who we need around us. What the church needs is husbands, wives, parents, children, young people, seniors, everyone to walk with Jesus day in and day out. Those who have been with Jesus and are walking with Jesus. When you are in Jesus Christ, you can't look at someone else in the church and say, well, I can't be like so-and-so, and and then assume you have nothing to do or offer. You don't have to be like so-and-so. You don't have to be like that guy or that lady. You need to be like Jesus. Have no confidence in the flesh, but have every confidence in the Spirit. For by the Spirit, Jesus transforms you, makes you faithful, and then makes you useful. Just as He moved these men from their natural weakness by His supernatural strength. But then to consider Judas, from trusted to traitor, what about Judas? The one who looked good, but faked it all along, at least before the other eleven. Judas, who we're told, became a traitor. And all through the New Testament, it's Judas who would betray him. That that, that language, who would betray him or who became a traitor, hangs around his ankles like a a ball and chain, dragging around with him everywhere he's mentioned. And you say, but Jesus prayed for the men whom He would call. He prayed to the Father for the wisdom to call the right men. Did God not answer? Did the Father not answer His prayer? No, His prayer was answered. His prayer was answered, and Jesus didn't choose wrong. In John 6, verse 70, He looks at His disciples, He says, Have I not chosen you, and one of you is a devil? He knew exactly who He was choosing, but it was part of the deliberate plan of God for our salvation. He, this is the humility of Christ and the submission of Christ that we see so beautifully displayed because He willingly chose Judas Iscariot, though He knew He was not going to truly follow Him and would one day betray Him. You think about that, well, did, prayer must not have worked. No, prayer doesn't work when we, when we get what we want. But in all our prayers, we must submit to the wisdom, the plan, and the power of God. Perhaps for us, that means we've been looking at prayer all wrong. I'm saying, we pray, we submit ourselves to God and trust Him to provide what we need, what was needed here was Judas. Judas was an answer to prayer as Jesus sought to faithfully carry out the work the Father had called him to do. But Judas comes to us as a warning. He is a, one of the most tragic stories uh, in the Scriptures, perhaps the most tragic. He had privileges that many of the disciples of Jesus didn't have. 
He was one of the twelve chosen to to become an apostle out of the crowd of disciples. He had the privilege of, of walking with Jesus and learning from Him and being taught by Him and having those private moments with Jesus that others didn't have, but He hardened His heart until He died in despair. Judas wasn't going against himself. He was following his own heart instead of following Jesus and he, until he died in despair. You and, it's just a reminder that we can do lots with an unregenerate heart. You can teach and pray and preach with an unregenerate heart. That's what Judas did. But for him, it was all a show, and there was a gradual hardening. Perhaps he started thinking, this is good. I like what he's saying, but there was no movement in the heart, and eventually the, his greed overcame him, and he was disillusioned with Jesus because he wasn't the kind of Messiah that he had hoped for, and he starts dipping his hand in the money bag, and then when it was like, great, I get to make a little bit more silver, and I'll get rid of this Jesus, it, was, it, was, it seemed to work together, and he hardened his heart. We can appear quite loyal and quite close and yet to, to Jesus and yet not be in Jesus. You can fool everyone else around you. Remember, it's not your gifts that make you a Christian. It's not your faithfulness to attend worship that makes you a Christian. It's not how, well, how many times you've read the Bible that makes you a Christian. It's not your experience. If you're leaning on anything else but simple faith in Jesus Christ, You're leaning on the wrong thing. You need Jesus Christ. It's a warning for us. What of our own hearts? What of your heart? Where is your hope? Have you been growing cold and lazy and feeling yourselves and desiring more and more the world that you thought you've been rescued from? These are questions to consider and answer on our knees before Jesus. And here's the hope that Judas will never know. If you're not right with Jesus right now, come to Him. If you're not right with Jesus, no matter how long you might might be living the hypocritical life, don't make it another day longer. But come to Jesus. Repent of your sin. Turn to Jesus. By His power, be transformed and changed. To build His church, the sent out Jesus first seeks His Father and then selects the twelve He will shape and send out. Here we've considered Jesus Christ's choice of the twelve, the process, and the men He chose. We look at Jesus Christ's choice, we considered it this morning, and wonder at the wisdom. We ought to wonder at the wisdom and give thanks for the 2,000 years of church history that has flowed out of this. For Christ has built His church and is building His church. And he's, they were built upon the foundation of the apostles with Christ as the cornerstone. And we benefit from what Jesus Christ did here on that mountain, on that day when He called the apostles. Trust the Lord then. Remember, don't question God and His leading in the church, but trust and submit to Him. As a church, we ought to then not question His wisdom and go with worldly wisdom for choosing our leaders and looking to the future, but trust Him. Take the wisdom that God gives us in the Scriptures, Christ's lead to call and ordain men to the offices. And trust that Jesus Christ will provide such men whom He chooses and whom He will shape and reshape for His church. And for all of us, let's rejoice in the Savior who who saved each one of us who believe in Him and who unifies us, though there are many things for which we, we have many differences we'd find amongst us, but we are unified in Jesus Christ. And so, therefore, pray for each other, for holiness, for faithfulness, and for a growing appreciation for the different people with whom we are in the church together. And in all things to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank You. As our King and our Head, we praise You and thank You for giving us, Lord, this instruction, for appointing the, the apostles you've given for the church. And even when Judas, Lord, died in despair, yet you provided another in his place. And we thank you for that. Lord, we thank you that thousands of years on, we see how, Lord, we need to still build the church on this foundation that you have provided. And we pray that we would, that we would be more faithful and into the future that we would continue to be faithful. And so, Lord God, we also pray that you would provide the, the, the leaders we need to lead this church forward in faithfulness and not to drift off into 
uh, in, into oblivion, or that we would there would be a legacy from this particular congregation that is one of faithfulness, of commitment to Christ until Christ returns. We pray that for the churches in our own area. We pray that for churches in our own denomination. We pray, Lord, that Your church would continue to grow around the world in faithfulness and truth. So continue to build Your church. You've not stopped with the appointment of the Twelve. You continue to build Your church. We thank and praise You for it. Lord, help us then to pray for her, to love the church as You love the church, and to, Lord, seek Your honor and glory in all of this. We pray that whatever might have been convicting from this passage in our hearts today, that we would, uh, Lord, grow through it, that we would be changed, even this would be, a, You would be changing us through this Word and making us more faithful as Your people. Thank You, Lord, for this message of hope, and thank You for the message of our Lord and Savior, King Jesus. We pray in His name. Amen. Let's sing hymn 348 in response. Hymn 348, Jesus with thy church abide. We'll stand to sing.
benediction will sing hymn 11, verses 1 and 2. you find those words in the liturgy in the bulletin. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ Himself and our God and Father, who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Amen. Thank you.